going to speak on the third industrial revolution for sustainable energy development in India. I will not deign to introduce Ram Prasad. <laughs> we were just discussing, he joined here in 1976 uh, and has been here now for, was, was here till 2012 and now he's back with us as a emeritus professor and was earlier in industry steel man but then migrated into being in an environment and development person. So, Thank you, Chandu. I mean, really always a delight to go back uh, to CDSP for any, for giving any talk or for any conference, any event. And today I am I'm coming after a break of uh, almost about more than one year. But what I am feeling, feeling really delighted most is uh, I can see the faces of students. <laughs> The great difference, you know, and my total uh, teaching lifespan is 42 years. Since when I first began in Princeton's college college. So, uh, thank you for assembling here this afternoon. I uh, thought of sharing what I have recently thought about on that <coughs> You you know, don't please don't get scared if you anywhere find that well. There are 97 slides in the in the presentation. I will go use only a subset of them. So that is for various because energy is such a subject, it is for various facets. So I will not discuss all the aspects. But you know, what is this third industrial revolution? Has it happened? No, it has not happened. It is being anticipated. What is this first or second? I thought I would begin by somewhat uh, going, taking a bit uh, historical perspective and looking back what has happened in the Industrial Revolution and what has been the, te no, the technology end, the driving force. Now, <coughs> We all know that when well, industrial revolution was essentially a revolution of productivity of labor because of that Adam Smith's principle of division of labor. Machines first came to use to facilitate this process of division of labor and which, in, you know, uh, uh, augmented fantastically with the very fast the productivity of labor. You know, that, uh, 18th century, 19th century. But what with, what made introduction of machine possible? There comes the rule of energy. It was energy which was driving the machine. Now this history of third or first or second is essentially what has been the form of the energy, the energy resource, which has been used in the <coughs> in the different phases of history. And how that has mattered, you know, things to be very different. So, <coughs> now, industrial revolution in its various phases has been induced by the discoveries of different energy resources and, as, uh, and associated technologies for their transformation. You know, energy resources as they are available in nature, you cannot directly you use them, they have to be transformed and uh, in, in a, some other form which can be used for the purpose of your work to be done. And uh, these uses have been very innovative and that is why we call them discoveries or innovations. There has been also, very interestingly, a convergence of new communication technology along with that of energy energy resources, energy technology. The two have developed, you know, one has influenced the other. And the two together, you know, it was a synergy of the two, that which resulted in a completely new social and economic, the impact has been such, not only the productivity of labor, but also it had in, its impact on social and economic organization, human capital formation, knowledge capital development. So, the two together 
led to now what is first industrial revolution now <clears throat> this level first revolution revolved around coal and steam energy that is the spark right what it led to it led to the development of railways that is one factory system of production you know this division of labor but in what kind of mode you, you know institutional mode or you know the uh, organization of mode it was it was the what the factory system required and so third is steam powered printing technologies right with coal the steam could be generated at such pressure temperature and all that that it could power uh, various things not only machine but also the printing printing technology developed with rotary press and neuro type etc now this had a fantastic impact on the explosion of of the printed communication there is books newspapers journals at large scale production and dissemination of information became first possible spread of mass literacy contributing to the development of a skilled workforce which would organize and manage industrial production actually these were of course it, these were felt as necessities no doubt and that is why the steam power when it was you know thought of its innovative use one of the major area was in this in this printing technology and through that communication and spread of knowledge second industrial revolution what was that this revolved around hydrocarbons and electricity automobile revolution is one aspect and highway development this is within the you know the uh, the consequence of the hydrocarbon now please note one thing that it is railways which came first not this highway movement that that followed it So the hydrocarbon is historically late. Now, <clears throat> what happened as a result? The locational organization of habitats and production got changed, and which had a very important civilizational impact. The town, city, the large scale, you know, long movements are possible now, right? Least cost solution of location, etc., became now. Not only people who were aware of it, people who were earlier also aware of it, but you know, they could get much more advantage and mileage out of out of this development. On the other hand, the electricity came soon. Electricity is discovery. We all know this is the most clean, this is the cleanest energy form, and its efficiency of uh, delivering. the desired outcome couple welfare outcome ultimately and of all the alternative options is the maximum i mean the options about energy options or all the resources coal you know wood or oil charcoal you can think of any number of things say there might be option of uh, use a uh, diesel but uh, or use uh, something else Uh, a coal uh, without transforming it into electricity now the amount of coal or electric oil what we i have to burn i have to you know what is the amount of which is given its efficiency of final job to be done like a machine to be driven a, a motor to be driven which will pump water now the amount of energy which will be required that would be much lower the man you know for with electricity and you see <coughs> approximately 50% of our energy the primary energy primary energy was what gross energy you are drawing from the nature half of it is transformed into the form of electricity and used and half remains primary now a more advanced economy will have the, the share of electricity to be half Now you all know there is a large area where electricity has not adequately penetrated. 
and there is a scarcity and the quality of electricity also matters. So these, these issues and aspects are there. But again, electricity had also very important impact on communication. It is uh, telecommunication first well, fallout of the second industrial revolution. Telegraph, telephone, radio, TV, and then, you know, after the electronic chips, you know, coming in the next century. Then, to, you know, there has been another revolution in the transformation. But it is electricity and electronics together that has made this recent, you know, the last century, <coughs> second last revolution, you know, possible. Use of electricity vastly raised the efficiency of use of material incidentally. TV, radio, telegraph, communication, it had also very important social impact. Use of electricity vastly raised the efficiency of use of material and energy resources and the cleanliness of the workplace. Fast communication having an important impact on human mobility and opportunities of uh, opportunities of betterment of life and flow of knowledge and information. But, <coughs> what is the but? But, the problem is, these are all fossil fuels. Both the revolutions were fossil fuels. And the adverse consequences due to greenhouse gas emission, you know, this threat of climate change, they have all now come up as a very important challenge for the sustainability of human development right? and economic, global economic, economic development. <coughs> Hence, there has already started a widespread search for new carbon free <coughs> renewable energy resources and which it is expected the days are coming which would bring a new third industrial development. Now this third industrial revolution as those who are working on this concept and they have a, they have a perception, they have a philosophy, not <coughs> that we have to all agree with it, that what the, it should target to really transform the society and getting rid, you know, minimizing the dependence on fossil fuel, ultimately just getting out of fossil fuel. Now this would revolve around development of renewables, obviously, hydrogen and fuel cell technology and that of energy internet for energy sharing. What is this energy internet? Like for information on the net, we know what, what is network, what is the net, internet. Now, to understand this, those who have written on this subject, I find, they summarize that this new revolution will be based on five pillars. One is every house building factory <coughs> has to become also a power plant. It would be it should be a cottage industry because every uh, you know uh, construction building should transform the wind, uh, water, and uh, you know the wind, uh, solar energy whatever it receives, or rains, water, everything to be harvested and transformed to the extent technologically and organizationally feasible into power. Maybe in a large scale, very small scale, of, you know, whatever be the scale. Now, and all requirement is to be met as far as possible by that generation. That is on the top of every room. If there is a solar panel and you heat your water to the extent it is required, so you don't require them electric, uh, electrical energy. <coughs> to that extent, electrical energy and fossil fuel burning is saved. Now, uh, a power to be produced when mainly, and that power to be mainly put out of these uh, renewables and biotic resources. Biotic resources are also. Hydro, uh, water-based hydroelectricity is also renewable. 
because water due to the water cycle uh, the the energy to based on biomass is also renewable because of carbon recycle so these are all within this say but about this biomass use there has to be a qualification as i'm coming to that later now energy resource development to converge <laughs> with the development of communication technology and internet leading to the emergence of smart grid of power now what would happen is the every every construction every unit of building factory etc including power plant you know everything is being imported they are producing some electricity they have an own need of electricity but then they are maybe either excess or short power now the excess is to be fed into the grid right power grid which will transmit power short power is to be drawn from the grid now it is this network which will do the electrical energy movement network now but that network now generally what happens transmission network distribution network it is in power flows where it is required right so the signals come but now what they say i am not an expert in the field but what i find they are writing chandru uh, please correct me if i am wrong is that there will be two way flow from every source or every consumer of power whether there is about the information about the demand level and excess supply level and what would travel along the along the network is the information both way that is from the source of electricity to the consumer and from the consumer to those who are who are requiring it so it is this two way flow and that is at an at, at a more advanced level of the information and energy flow both way right it would it would so uh, automated control system could be established that it will it will according to those information flow it will it will regulate the flow divert the flows right so that there is a coordination end up with the coordination and uh, everybody you know as best as possible makes its operation of course this is a very big challenge and this also the large extent depend on you know the efficiency of our software development to which we are given to these are all computerized programs you know we need the automated control this would enable a two way flow of knowledge and, uh, and for energy share sharing the whoever is excess they can you know share with those who are in deficit excess area and deficit area okay. now automobiles on the other hand what about automobiles now automobiles is an area where energy substitution as of, as we you know find now the fuel substitution is very difficult you cannot get out of hydrocarbon so it is only in railway you find electricity can be used you can <coughs> you can get out of uh, hydrocarbon is it but still to what extent that is possible what is the of the total movement of a ton kilometer of freight goods or passenger kilometer of services to use them in the the major amount you find that between 85 to 90 to 90% i think it may be even be more the share would be uh, by by road now here can electricity play a role because if electricity play a role then only you can you know also for uh, mobility of goods and human you can depend on it the target the what it is the search for is automobiles to be driven by electricity this has started sorry replacing internal combustion engine a new technology is coming up where uh, and what how what would replace that one is 
possibility of the use of hydrogen to be developed as an energy resource. And fuel cell is a device of storage of, uh, storage of the resource and supply of the electricity. Um, uh, I am not really, you know, I am not fully understood, I have tried to, but I think you know much better about, uh, about the fuel cell. Uh, uh, the, I think it is, one example is that water, first by electrolysis is split and hydrogen is taken out. And then hydrogen goes to the fuel cell and it can transform it into electricity. Then again that electricity will have to be used to, uh, to possibly, we will end up with some water. I don't know. No, electricity will be again used in, in through electric electrolysis process. And but what I, I, I found I am not being able to exactly record is that again end up with some water. And that water again would be recycled. So it is there is some cycle. But what I'm confused about, is it a power plant or a or, or a you know transport vehicle? So it, it has to carry. Possibly that uh, mini, you know, power plant. Because the electricity has to be generated. You know, hydrogen can also come. I am told in, in the other form of you know reagent, which can be used to again to some uh, fuel cell, transform into electricity. But then again, electricity has to be used in a manner that it can be repeated. I mean, you, you have to without there is now and many places being used is battery. You battery driven car, car, the battery you take out from time to time, put in a plug and recharge it and then again you use it. That is, you know, there are many, many places electric car, but they are of that kind of thing. But here what they are visualizing is a much more wider use because if after going 30 kilometers or 40 kilometers you have to now get a place where you can recharge your battery. Then the big hassle. So so that you know to upgrade it, the search is for this process and then the quill search. All these would be accompanied, obviously, by fast digitization of among other things, also of manufacture. This is what they are targeting about. Infrastructural of not only manufacture, manufacture, infrastructural operation and development of new synthetic materials and technology like 3D printing, which will enable achievement of higher energy efficiency. So energy efficiency is another dimension, which they are trying, they are targeting to achieve. Then the challenge of total supply of electricity will come down and things will be manageable and, you know, better than possible with existing resources we have done. Now, so what these, that would enable achievement of higher energy efficiency, reduce the micro level <coughs> scale of production and make production of complex commodities also be cost So these are all in the agenda. So there are all these five pillars, one it is just not power. It is about automobile sector, <coughs> fuel cell technology development, hydrogen use in to what extent is possible, and then digitization of manufacturing, digitization of operation of infrastructure, that is automation, and scale of production that they have, you know, smaller scale and at micro level it will be very effective. Now, this means that and then they say that emergence of distributed capitalism is possible. Inclusive development will be possible. Because there will be then many players in the field. The only thing all these descriptions and the switching that do not address the huge amount of capital financing, financial requirement, which is required for the transformation, how can that be distributed? You know, who will control ultimately the flow of monetary resources, financial resources? That is going to ultimately determine. Many people may be participating, 
but they may be under the thumb of, you know, a, a, a number of financial, a limited number of financial. What discussion is all lacking is that how to finance such a big challenge? Who will provide it? To what extent stay? To what extent you can have consortium? To what extent you can have cooperatives at a, a smaller level? You know, how do you have empowerment, gradual empowerment of the people, you know, of different uh, sections of, uh, <coughs> of society, of differential economic ability, financial ability, how you can with them together, you can, you can visualize the picture of development. These aspects are not being addressed. All these are mostly technologists and scientists and technologists. It is their vision. In fact, it's really very good that the humanity is thinking. There are innovative people, there are scientists, very worried about art's future. And they are saying, oh no, no, something has to be done on a war footing. What has to be done? They have drafted some agenda. I'm sure after one year or two years, you will find this list to be changing. But what is needed, where social scientists, economists can contribute to see side by side that the operationalization is just not technology or, you know, physically operationalized, but also it has got its cost. One cannot just wish away the cost thing. And what is the, how can that be, make things operational and feasible? Now, uh, let us see what is the growth of deployment of clean technology as of today. Shows growth rate in the range of, uh, I think, the last decade, I think, first decade of this century, uh, I mean, 21st century. Well, this was in the range of 27% to 56%. If you look across, you know, technology and across uh, the country, also. This is the However, we are still grappling with the problems of the second industrial revolution, the kind of pollution and also scarcity of the infrastructure and so on. So. There is still a huge dependency on fossil fuels. Fossil fuel has supplied 50% of the new energy, new energy demand in between 2001 and 2010. Whatever has been the additional energy demand, 50% has been went by the new, of that energy demand has been made by person. Oil has supplied 94% of the total fuel requirement of the transport sector. Non-hydropower from renewables supplied only 3% of final energy produced in 2009. That is, if you take hydro storage can Supply, supply is included But if you take that out, the new renewables in, does not include the uh, this uh, storage hydro, that is big dams, etc. They are not included. They are not calculated. This calculus and balance sheet is prepared on the basis of the uh, non-hydro, actually non-storage. They generally new renewables take into account wind, uh, solar power and, um, uh, uh, and, and micro hydro, what it's called, tidal, micro hydro. And then also there is biomass based, but biomass based not unconverted, but convert it into bagas. Um, I mean, the, the, say if you take the form of bagas or other waste, right, <coughs> agro waste and then convert them into in, in, in what is called the biodigester. The, the, the digester converted into gas, biogas. And then that gas you use either for, you know, you're burning uh, uh, some stove or you can use that more efficiently really for uh, generating power at a, at a micro scale and uh, which can be used for irrigation particularly in rural areas. Now, uh, so non-hydro, that means if you exclude hydro storage and only take care of these uh, 
renewables. Renewables do not include nuclear. Renewables do not include nuclear. The carbon would include all these fossil fuel and uh, fossil fuel being carbon and then hydro storage and then nuclear. Then the rest we classify as new renewables. Now that renewables was only about 3%. This has led to the steady rise in the CO2 emission by now I am coming to the G20 countries. G20 will be covering about 80% of world population. I think around 80% of world population. The world emission in 2010 reached a record high of 30.6 gigaton that year. The G20 countries today account for 80% of the energy related CO2 emission. And per capita CO2 emission widely varies across countries in the range from 1.4 to, I have not been able to see this here, I think, 1.4 to, uh, I think this last line is not coming even in my computer. Um, I think. 17.7, you know, per <coughs> oh, because of the high OECD countries, high income countries. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, I think US is around 20. Now, what I will speak about less depends on what is the time we can have. That is now, I would say another issue about, okay, all these are causing, how can human use of energy or even other resources cause stress to the nature and to our ecosystems? Let us just take this to that, and then I again come back to energy. And when I come back to energy, I will mainly focus on India's current position about, I will show a few, uh, you know, charts and uh, diagrams which will illustrate this equation and then we will round up. So, for your screen, can Yeah, just press F5. F5. Just press F5. 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 Oh. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. 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 We'll have to go back to where you are. Just keep doing it. Keep going. Okay. <coughs> now you see, now I, there is this concept of ecological footprint. In the scientists, or eco, eco, ecologists, and eco scientists, they have developed this concept. Now the issue was how do we measure the, you know, the just as poverty is one aspect of or Gini coefficient gives you one one important uh, parameter of development. How far things have developed? Have poverty been reduced apart from GDP per capita? Or he has been the uh, uh, Gini coefficient has come down. What is the impact? So far as social sharing of the product, social product is concerned. Similarly, issue comes up that okay, apart from the aspect of social sustainability, which is linked with the sharing of benefit of growth. What is happening with the stress we are causing to the ecosystem? Because if the ecosystem is goes on eroding, then there will be ending up with the problem of scarcity of resources, you know, depleted. There are no minerals, no, you know, and, and the other thing is uh, the biomass has been, you know, Forests are denuded, vast areas denuded of forests, desertification has taken place, right? Then qualitative aspect, air pollution, water pollution, the amount of drinkable water for the humans, you know, if it comes down. So then there is going to be a huge crisis. So how, how to measure this? Now there have been several, you know, attempts at doing this. This is what scientists did. 
there is another sometimes people only go by CO2 because climate don't do our climate. You know, this is somewhat policy driven. What kind of policy issues people want to take up? And accordingly they develop the indicator. So this is one kind of indicator where it is the ecosystem must have its productivity, regenerating ability. So that is one aspect. The other aspect is climate change must be controlled. There has been a third aspect that human health and ecosystem's health has to be protected. And in, along that line, the uh, this uh, Columbia University and Yale, these two universities, both scientists and I think also some so of the social scientists, they have worked together and they develop an index. What is this? The, the, the EPI percentage, Environmental Performance Index. Now, these indices are prepared for all the countries as far as possible. In fact, in, in, in 2011, 2011, the Human Development Report, which is on development and equity, equity aspect. Now there they have addressed the equity, human development, environmental development, and GDP growth. All these they have very interesting, you know, tables that volume consists. But side by side they show. HDI index, HDI in excluding the income part, because in one sense, in HDI, uh, if you say consider HDI, then it, is, it also considers, suppose you are comparing with uh, GDP per capita, GNP per capita, which, which every report does. Now you are, uh, you, you are comparing one with, with its, uh, one index and the other is in one of the subsets, you know, one of the components. So, which is not true independent comparison. So that is why they have put this non-income HDI, HDI, also per capita income, per capita CO2 emission, and then also this uh, EPI index. Now, what is, I will not go to the EPI index, I will go to this ecological footprint uh, and biocapacity. This is in short, following. You know, any human consumption, right, it will require some land use. Either the land produces some output which is consumed or it indirectly, how it is affected, it causes a diversion of the use of land, of land use. For example, you will find, I do not have it uh, here possibly, no, I do not have that graph here. You see, there is this cropland demand for food, right? Food and other agriculture, agricultural product. Then there is uh, uh, pastoral <coughs> demand for animal uh, feed, right? That is also for uh, human, ultimately for human consumption, because all meat product and all that. You know. Third say fishing area, the water area in which both coastal and in the inland, whatever is, wherever you are harvesting, you consider those areas, they are being, you know, appropriated in, for the human consumption. Then would come, among other things, you know, say industrial products, you require minerals, you require mines, and factory construction. Towns are developing. Now, all these are, would be, you know, the building and other construction, where these operations can take place. Now, which will be demanding certain diversion of land, certain use of land. Every year, so much land is being occupied. Now, and then you will find, now these are all per capita calculated, you know, how much is going for what. And then, there is also one column you will find in such table, which is carbon footprint. What is carbon footprint? Carbon footprint is, now all fossil fuel, when this fossil fuel is burned, there is carbon dioxide emission. Now carbon by the recycling, by, you know, uh, photo through photosynthesis, a large part is absorbed. Recycled. Ocean also absorbs 
in but particularly in North Atlantic, a huge amount of carbon dioxide. But still there is a significant balance, you know, unabsorbed carbon dioxide. And it is that carbon dioxide which is the cause of worry for climate change. Okay? So that contributes to the worry. Now, this, the calculate that if that carbon dioxide is to be absorbed through recycling, then how much forest area would be required? Mind you, forest is also, forest use of uh, land is also one column, but that forest use is only for forest product for which humans are interested. That does not include this area. Now when this is calculated, it is considered that whatever even that existing, uh, you know, forest, which is giving human certain, you know, products, timber or non-timber forest products, even <coughs> they, they would absorb also something, even taking care of all these, netting out, then whatever is the balance, how much is required for that? That is called carbon footprint. Now, I have this table where uh, there is, now the sum of all those footprints, it gives you the total ecological footprint. Now, how, you see, what is the significance? How do we add it? What does it mean? Different land is performing different uh, kind of uh, function. It is really <coughs> found, find out, found out what is its productivity as per the photosynthetic ability for the crop land. If crop is to be produced, this is a certain efficiency. Now, if crop land equivalent, there is all are normalized in terms of the, the numerator as if it is crop land. Whatever is productivity of, of say, fishing ground or forest and cropland. Now, is the cropland because it is monoculture, it is considered to be one of the highest productivity. So, now this, if you convert a land area in the efficiency unit of cropland, and then again in different places, productivity is different. Taken the global average, so global average typical in cropland unit. These are all calculated. Once they are calculated, then you find out what is the, what is, then you can compare across country. Now, it is very interesting that the carbon footprint in this total calculation, carbon footprint for the world is 1.41 and total ecological footprint is 2.7 in that year, 2007. <laughs> year so, so more than uh, in a 52.2 percent is really the carbon footprint and rest is all non-carbon foot footprint you know. now this is one side the other side is what is the bio capacity that means different land biodiversity you know of different categories how much of again in terms of global average productivity how much it could have given now you will find forest area, still we are excess, we mean in the world, it has got area, what we are using, it can, if you want, you can, it can provide more. Similarly for uh, several other things, but when it comes to carbon footprint, the biocapacity side there is nothing, because there is no land which is absorbing, this is what is the, what is the excess requirement. So it is because of this carbon footprint that you are finding the total ecological stress in terms of ecological footprint is so high. This would people would now say, science policy people, that now the whole thrust of the of science policy, uh, the world should be towards is uh, you know, carbon reduction, low carbon growth, and to reduce the carbon footprint. And then you immediately end up with what is the major source? More than 50%, around 60% source is just from fossil fuels. And this carbon footprint is not fossil fuels, but for any other thing. So that is why all these you know, noise and discussions around this. Now, when you try to abate and when you try to follow a low carbon growth, right? mitigation, adaptation, etc., all, all kinds of Then, of course, you have uh, various problems which has got 
various macroeconomic issues. That could lead to a different area of research and discovery. Just as I pointed out that third industrial revolution, what they're trying to do, how to finance such a challenge, just that, that opens up an area of investigation and economic research. Similarly, this also, you cannot just wish away, you know, the all tomorrow all uh, carbon uh, footprint would be gone. What actually now the global community, they have accepted that, well, <laughs> everything cannot be evaded. We cannot, if you, if you really want that, then the carbon is to be stabilized at such a level that many countries' GDP has to be, would have been left to be slashed. <laughs> such a negative growth is required to really constant climate condition, if you try. Now, since that would not be feasible, what people are trying to do, stabilize at a, at a level where things are so manageable, maybe slowly growing, growth rate, try to minimize as, come, as far as possible. But what is, to some climate change, it would be inevitable. What is the best way to <coughs> adapt to that climate change? Climate change would happen. And in the history of humanity of this earth, many things have happened. Which is, you know, if you look at the history of uh, world's history of uh, uh, environment, there have been changes. In fact, I was chatting one day with one of my uh, geologist friends of uh, Delhi University, in uh, is uh, he says that actually the Earth is now on the downswing of this out ice age that started movement towards ice age. Now what is then what are we what is happening? What will be the impact of that? Now the curve is not smooth. The curve would be zigzag, zigzag, and the trend is downward. Now what is what would happen? This human intervention and too much of growth, it would it would have a you know some zigzag, you know, a kink like this, and then again it would come down. But what would happen, that kink itself possibly within 200, 300 years or 400 years. Now there within that period, the human suffering should be involved because of all climate change, flooding and uh, uh, you know, this, uh, what all we read about is uh, the iron country will be very much suffering, all ocean level will rise, etc, etc. Now, uh, and, but to meet the challenge of both mitigation, because it would be a combination of mitigation and, and, and adaptation. Adaptation is what can we do so that the suffering can be minimized? What kind of infrastructure we should develop so that floods can be resisted? Inundation is, 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 can, can be resisted. So, you know, for that, you have to spend again. So, some cost of anything you know, just the other day I was listening to some presentation where saying that well, this is a completely win-win situation, we have no cost. I think that well, the world is always, I find that in, in such a position that anything you want to achieve, you have to sacrifice at some other end. Now, how, how, what value you impute to them, you know, it depends on that. Maybe that your value system is changes, then you may welcome certain things, which will be making things easier. So, now, after this, so that economics of this mitigation and adaptation, that is a huge idea, and many people are working, and what is this micro, macro mitigation, these are all linked with, you know, economics of any, any economic activity which is mediated by water. There you will find the challenges arising and how to meet these challenges and what is the what is the economic part what it would involve in the analysis. Now this is what carbon footprint uh, and around <coughs> 75 to 75 and 80 actually the power capacity ecological capacity of the earth we have crossed things are moving number so number of what is that does that say number of earths? Uh, number of what means Total demand of land area. 
area. How would he calculate right. it in terms of some standardized language? Right, standardized. Right. Yes, yes, of course. And actually, the, it requires. I I wrote one small. Uh, In Madras uh, school, uh, uh, published. But it is there is one kind of strong assumption. Very difficult, very challenging to write. There are also people who say this is the word of living, living planet. We want to take you to the world. How much of biomass is there? What kind of variety? What is what to talk about? 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 You know, let me tell you that biomass, various kinds of species, not only plants, If plants are all gone, <laughs> within a few days, everything, all uh, animal species will be gone, including humans. But the diversity, not just existence of you know various species, but also diversity is very important because they keep the balance of the earth, in the eco balance of the earth. You know, if they are suppose some area is very much denuded of the biodiversity. Ultimate impact will be that you will find not only a lot of uh, you know bio outputs we will be missing from consumption, but a more important thing is this: the resilience power of ecosystem will become. What is resilience power? Suppose there has been a shock to the ecosystem, a huge flood, and you know uh, an earthquake. Uh, A storm cyclone. Say this Orissa cyclone. You know what was nineteen? Sometimes in nineteen, which was the worst of our memory. Yeah. Nineteen nineteen. Now it was the the scientists say that to get back to the old ecological landscape, which is being mainly determined by the biodiversity, minimum requirement is fifty years. Now you see why we do not talk about that because we neglect those those areas, possibly, or you know until uh, people feel the pinch of it. Those most probably poor people must feel feel the pinch of it. Now let me quickly go to now these are India's ecological footprint, per capita GDP growth, and India's biocapacity. See the comparative levels. Uh, you know the. Scale is different. Right hand scale, side scale is GDP per capita, and left hand scale, the side scale is, I think, global hectare uh, per person. You know, you know like so these two are different scale, but the 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 slope, how it has grown, and how these two curves have moved, both have gone down. Right, the capacity as well as a. Well, if if appropriation is more than the bio capacity, then the capacity will be eroded. This is the problem. Now, <clears throat> we if you come to this, this is China. The China situation is you know <coughs> they have a sharper growth of GDP. Okay, so the money can't help it. But their bio capacity has a very moderately decline. But their footprint has gone up. Like it is only after I think uh, 2000 uh, around uh, after uh, you know there is no recovery. You know, it's steadily declined. But uh, but the footprint increase is only after uh, I think in the first decade. I think they had their policies getting possibly reflected here. Why is it stable? So it's a per capita thing. So ecological footprint per capita. Per capita. So that means a population rise will have a negative impact. Huh? Uh, it is very much. Uh, yes. The, the per capita actually how much consumption is is mattering. That is the thing. And on the other hand, the availability. That figure will also be going down. So it is the difference between the two. 
which really matters. Why is biocapacity stable in China over the last four decades? Like in, over India is also. No, that means down. the bio. In India, it's coming down. But in China, it's stable. And didn't you say that the ecological footprint should actually uh, has an impact on the biocapacity? Bio, bio capacity, no. If there is if bio capacity is falling short, bio capacity is falling short of footprint. Then, then there is a deficit. That is but, called yeah. that is called That's ecological right. deficit. Yes. The ecological deficit would erode. The reproductive capacity of exactly. the ecosystem. Exactly. So therefore, the biocapacity should come down, especially here when the gap is. China is high. Now it is stable. It in is, India, it's coming it, down, and that makes sense. In China, it is stable. That's what I don't you understand. Don't, I, you know, I don't know. You know, this is what I I I, I found that I'm trying. But yes, you are right that there is there are some puzzles. This is India. I think but I think I think, I think India's data are more honest data. <laughs> <laughs> because so that, there is one the kind of doctor that dictate about the data. <laughs> that is one of our things. Yes. 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 Because bio capacity reverse is very difficult. Very very difficult. You have to do yeah, so such power. ecological engineering yeah, so principle. Power of the it is very challenging. So, but so, uh, no, uh, ecological food. 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 It's possible. It's possible that part of the... That is but so, then policies to do it didn't really start until the 2000s. And you're looking at the long issue the... Especially if, if by biotechnology, if you can make it more productive, then in terms of cropland, you know, unit, it, it is possible under certain situation, it will now be, it has augmented as compared to earlier. But that's now, and we are looking at three, four decades. Wait, which one? This one, we are looking at really three decades of stability. It is, no, there is gradual some decline. You know, there is gradual some decline. It was here. If this is the scale, not this scale. This is the scale and it is heavier. Yeah, we got a graph for any other country as well. Ha, ha, ha. Now, let's see. You also there is a decline. You, yeah, it should be a decline. Decline makes sense. That's why I find China so interesting. EU. EU is a more, more, more stable. But Again, it's slightly rising, in fact, if you look at it from the mid 70s. And this Europeans are quite crazy about ecosystem <laughs> conservation and no, such what is, How is it measured? What is, what is the definition of that? Uh, can I just add something, ma'am? It is possible that the emission is impacting somewhere else. In other words, the ecological footprint really? that you are collecting, that you are calculating is out of the production and consumption that is taking place within the economy. Yes. But the footprint is taking place somewhere else. So as a result of which, biocapacity within the domestic territory. Uh, yes, no, the is it the footprint? No, no, no. It's calculated in terms of domestic production. No, listen, listen, listen. We should look at consumption. No, let me correct it. So far as trade flows are concerned, whatever is imported, right? It is calculated here, importing countries' footprint, oh, is and that not there. No, no. In fact, I read many articles which are saying that it should be that way, but it isn't. So in this calculation, oh, in this I am calculation. Yeah. Yeah. and the formula, yeah. but in that, uh, in that, this includes the in that small monogram, uh -huh. I have you know explained all this. So basically, but in my book also. I have explained uh, this thing. But if it is exported, then it will be on the customer. Those who are importing, it will be on their account. Yep. It will be on their account. So that way the question that you are raising is very pertinent. Because it's still that, then it makes even less sense. Right. Then, right, the, right. then you should actually see a much more significant decline. Okay. Now to ensure the control of GHG emission, the G20 countries need to cooperate this was about the G20 and I had to give some seminar in G20, some research forum. 
and give special thrust to the following issue, which is irrespective of G20's value. Energy conservation by raising efficiency of end use of energy, that is one. Raising the efficiency of energy resource conversion into electricity and its distribution. Raising the share, raising the share of carbon free or carbon neutral resources. The ushering of Ushering of now, we began by third industrial revolution. Ushering of a third industrial revolution as induced by deliberate policy initiative and coordination at international level, which is very much would be required, would contribute substantively to the mentioned objectives of sustainable energy development. This would be achieved mainly through the accelerated introduction of non hydro renewables and development of energy internet for energy sharing, sharing through a smart grid and through the digitization of manufacturing and infrastructure. Now, I would not go through the energy scenario, I will just show a few few charts and then, then conclude. Uh, we are really far off from that, you know, whatever vision we are thinking. But the point is this, unless we become conscious and the policies get, you know, uh, and these are the, uh, in the vision, uh, well, things would be too bad possibly in future. That is why all these discussions have started. Now, uh, India's uh, fossil fuel is 96% uh, of, uh, other than biomass. Biomass I have taken out, and then whatever is the commercial. Remember, biomass still is 25% of our total <coughs> 75% roughly is commercial. Which year is this? Which year? This is 2010. I think I got it from 2010 or something. I think possible 2010. And uh, these are international energy association matters. And The power is an important component. That is all primary resource. Now it is the converted only power part. The power when I am generating it, the I am using alternative fuels. Now this is gross power generation share, not fuels share. I have used seventy percent of my gross electricity generation is from coal. Eleven point five percent my gas. 1.7 by fuel oil. Hydro, 30%. Nuclear, 2.3. And really new renewables, only 1.5. Okay? But future is, seems to be very different. This is the mix of power generation, if I just transform that. Now I am mainly talking, we talking about power. <coughs> because in power you have the substituted energy, the main possibility. So this is the same thing again. Now, energy scenario is characterized by three distinguishing features in India. The dependence to the extent of 25% approximately on biomass, high dependence of fossil fuel, and the domination of coal in the scenario, right? It is important to note here again that, that whole thing, 50% of total primary commercial energy is to power. However, interesting. The share of electricity in the final commercial energy, that is after kind of conversion, electricity share here is 21 percent. Whereas primary resources which is being converted, electricity <laughs> share is 50 percent. How do we explain this difference? Because of the much higher efficiency of electricity for the final use. Okay, let me just skip to this. This is about installed capacity share. Now, this is latest 2012. For the composition of hydro, thermal, nuclear, renewables like that. What's the point of all this? Huh? What's the point of all this? The point of all this is that we are still far off from the 
radio we are the very so much of now talk and hala gulla about the radio but where are we so far as radio is concerned now you look at this this diagram this says what capacity we have built up mind it this is not generation as of today <coughs> capacity we have built up we could use say thermal hydro 56% is thermal uh, 17% hydro 15% is of non utilities 10% is grid connected renewable really. really. That was at that 21% in explain that to me. Which one? See, you, you have a table which is your gross part. What is the the base uh, raw material source? Whether it comes from coal or whether it comes from gas or nuclear or whatever it is. But then you have this 21% that commercial energy is electricity. Final means, what does that mean? Final means it is electricity converted uh, the distinct hydrocarbons. And uh, so we are basically are saying uh, fuel and, and, and coal, coal as it is used, but not power, oh, right. so steel and other. If you take that, then you find electricity is shared because these are all in oil equivalent. So in oil equivalent, you need efficiency being very different. That is why you get this. Now this is the capacity. How much we have progressed? Two percent is is I think the nuclear. 10% is renewables, new renewables. 15% is non utility, right? Captive. So, this is capacity in terms of what? The megawatt, megawatts of generation or what? No, not generation. Megawatt. Or gigawatt. No. In terms of what? Capacity. This is not utilization. Mind it. The A's, you, uh, uh, PLF would be much lower. The uh, hydrogen base capacity would be lower. So the we and if you take about the off-grid capacity, those which are off-grid, they are like no, this is grid connected. Who are providing this wind? One is wind, the other is you know, next is bagas based uh, electricity, waste to energy, solar PV. Solar PV, these are all, you know, the percentage. But how do they put this the gas price energy onto the grid? And, and who, who puts, you know, the gas price thing? Which no, gas uh, being converted into electricity. These are all being no, converted into electricity. Grid. And then it's put onto the grid. What is this bagas? Whatever is excess oh. is being put, put into the grid. It's like the biogas plants and plants. Now you see, I, I say, of the capacity about the previous slide, about 10% uh, is the renewables. These renewables are grid connected. Off grid is almost zero. Zero means actually point something. Very small amount. That is why it has come zero. Now, here you find the most important thing is co generation and uh, waste to energy, uh, the biomass gasifier, all these systems. The solar PV is not a very significant uh, share. So these uh, biomass things which are then connected to the grid, huh. where are they? Who, the, who does these? Are they private companies? Are they mostly private? Or is it some public sector or some NGO things? Or what happens? Everything to together. Is it profitable to do it? It is better. Yes, in fact, it is increasing. In fact, this is actually 31st August 2013. As later data, the ministry collected it. I took it from ministry and private commission source. And this is off grid. Now, we generally say one of the great merit of green renewables is off grid. But off grid's total quantum is so small, very small as of now, even less than bigger. But again, if you look at here, just as grid connected, it is the wind which is the so dominant. Is that thing is also non-bagas, non you know. Sure, what is the economic See, that is 
What's the economics of this biomass? What is it's making waste. it more profitable? Waste, waste, waste. 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 No, being I know, converted what, into. I know that's what it is. I'm asking the economics of it. What is it that is making it more? No, profitable? these are costly. These are costly. So yeah, that's why I'm I'm curious how. Come you, know, you know the the point is this, that is why it is very gradually coming up. No, sixteen percent is quite a lot. Ma'am, yeah. this I is know. not the this is the potential, not the realized. No, 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 no. This is the real life. capacity. This is the capacity has been installed. Installed, but it's not. No, but the point no, is no. there are enough it's people making it and connecting it to the grid. Connecting it That's to the grid. That's a lot. One is, I think, they get, get subsidy. They, they, they get that subsidy. subsidy. That is one. And again, one thing. Because wind is the. We no, no. have also have to take into consideration. Non, this, these, these, you know, renewables are. For one point five percent of total. Hmm. Oh, so it's only sixteen percent of one point five. Right, right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yes. That is why you are saying where are they? Yeah. Yeah. That is why where are they? Yeah. 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 Now, Actually, I know, I know uh, like you. a a cattle, I mean, a buffalo meat uh, yeah. uh, factory yeah. in Lucknow. Yeah. Uh, they are under ISO and some euro kind of yeah. thing. Actually, the, those cows live fast a lot. Yeah. So the Actually, the cows farting, actually, they are farting natural gases. Wow. Mm. So, they uh, use the natural gases to burn up the, some small generator kind of thing. So, that it provides the whole factory's electricity uh, supply. Like, <laughs> <laughs> How do they go and collect all the power? No, like, they, they have this lower, uh, lower atmosphere pressure uh, pressure oh, wow. in a van room. So, Mix of two. Like, this is the really the potential in terms of megawatt. I mean the gigawatt or megawatt. So you know the percentage is uh, and capacity factor will vary across the resources. And solar we have lot of lot of potential. But it's load factor, capacity factor would be very low and it will take time, you know, quite a bit of time to realize the Now, the point is this, now let me conclude by saying that, uh, that, uh, Thank you. <laughs> I would just like to say, that uh, this, uh, the, this third industrial revolution, we are, we are quite far off. But you know, there are a few big challenges. One is this financing. The other is, we are not realizing now, say it is in the demand which fluctuates. But on the supply side also now would be instability. Because supply will also fluctuate, even if it is grid connected, depending on the availability flow of these natural resources. And if you say that, no, 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 more you depend, we depend on sunlight and wind, right? More on micro hydel. The hydel system depends on water flow. Ultimately, everything depends on, and now none of them you are storing, you can store to any significant extent. So this fluctuation <laughs> would, be, would be there in the grid. That requires, not, that requires, that you have to have for each one, the capacity compared to need higher and also the greed has to be very strong, technology has to be very strong and expensive, it would also be expensive. Plus, this would be highly knowledge intensive. And the problem is the knowledge market is so imperfect the, and monopolistic that the prices, what kind of prices ultimately would emerge when these technologies even stabilize. We are very lucky that 
about these uh, so particularly mobile and communication technology, these have become quite fast to come down. What would happen to these? These are all, you know, in future. It's quite possible that in 21st century, you say, see a radical transformation. But see, that radical transformation would really make sense if it comes with the kind of sliding down of price, which we have experienced, experienced in, uh, you know, the communication. Don't be so optimistic. The bid is 53,000 crores now for <laughs> Spectrum. <laughs> so tomorrow they might have to raise prices again. <laughs> so, you know, so, and unless, this is my last, my last point, unless there is a global understanding. And unless there is, because these will be very highly concentrated in certain countries, unless there comes, they come to the point of this global and the, and the cooperation, you know, there will be again a very differential sharing of the benefit from all these revolutions between the north and the south. So I could have elaborated this last point for half an hour, but, but, but we won't let you. <laughs> I, should, I should not be honest. Any question? No. Yeah. Now.